Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Rosé Winemaking webinar. My name is Eglantine Chauffour. I will be your speaker today. I'm the winemaking product manager at Boucher Bassin America, and I represent La Motte Abier. I'm particularly excited today to talk about Rosé winemaking as it is um, my favorite wine to make. It's one of my favorite wine to drink, but mostly I'm gonna be able to share a trial result with you that has been done at the uh, research center dedicated of Rosé, where I spent a few years there um, working. So I'm gonna be able to share the result of my ex colleagues So I'm pretty proud of this. Okay, so before we dive into the topic of the webinar, let me introduce you the two partners for this presentation. We have Boucher Vasselin, designer, manufacturer, and seller of white material for grape and wine processing since 1856. So quite a strong uh, presence and experience all around the world in the wine industry. And we also have La Motte Abier, which are a renowned analogical product for their high quality. They have been founded in Bordeaux in 1878, so 140 years of expertise and winemaking experience. We are now making it available for you in North America, so pretty new in North America, but definitely not new in Europe. As Boucher Vasselin and North America is expanding their portfolio and we are offering now complete solution to winemakers. We are not only distributing Boucher Vassin equipment and La Motabier winemaking product, but also Costral bottling line and Caso wine pump. So feel free to visit our website at bvnorthamerica.com. You will find all the information you need there. So now let's talk about Rosé. Okay, so Rosé uh, wines are usually defined by uh, their color, right? And um, then that you can have a very big palette of color available that uh, stay in the category of rosé. As you can see in the screen, there is a big, um, a big palette. We also talk about um, aromas. Rosé wines are usually very um, aromatic and very delicate on the nose, very fresh. So the palette of aromas can go from very citrusy, grapefruit, um, floral, but also very fruity, such as strawberry, raspberry, um, cherry, and then we can go also on the spectrum of jammy. So huge palette of color, huge palette of um, aromas, but actually a good rosé has also a very balanced mouthfeel. When I say balance, it actually, um, as it is, it doesn't mean much. When I'm saying balance, I'm meaning most feels that is coherent with the nose and with the color. So balance on its own. So the wine has actually um, needs to have a coherence. So when you are looking at a color, you are expecting an, an aroma that goes usually uh, with a mouthfeel. So that's what we want to offer to our consumer is a rosé wine that is coherent. For example, if we are in the palette of the O12, N12, as we can see on the top here, that are very light and almost yellow or um, white wine color, we are usually expecting aromas such as citrusy um, or maybe some pear or very like white peaches type of aroma, but very light aromas. And this goes with an expectation of a mouthfeel that is more acidic, less sweet, lower alcohol, and maybe some slight bitterness on the finish to give some length, but not really um, tannic structure. On the other spectrum, if we are talking about rosé that are on the A3 or B3 color, so much darker, much redder color, we are usually expecting aromas such as cherry, strawberry, raspberry, more ripe and red fruit um, aromas. And this goes with a mouthfeel that has higher alcohol, higher weight, higher volume, more phenolic compounds, but also lower acidity and uh, it can be acceptable to be more sweet. Okay, so just to give you an example, but I really personally think that what is important here when we are talking about rosé wine is to be coherent between the colors, the aromas, and the mouthfeel, which means we are going to work on the three parameters during the full production. But really, the color is going to define the style you are looking for and which aromas 
you are going to try to produce and which mouse field you are going to try to achieve. Okay, so now let's talk production. Um, rosé wine can be done in two ways. In reality, they can be done in three. Um, I just don't really want to talk about blending whites and reds, if you don't mind. So I will talk about direct pressing and saigné. Direct press is the method the most used when we are talking about more qualitative rosé. Doesn't mean we cannot make good rosé from saigné. That's not true. We can make excellent wine from saigné. Um, but the most common, um, commonly used technique is direct pressing, which means usually we are growing grapes for rosé, we are picking grapes for rosé, we are then pressing them and we are treating the wine as a white wine. Seigneur, on the other hand, is um, we will have to do some more adjustment because we are dealing with grapes that has been harvested for red wine. So with higher maturity, um, higher alcohol content, higher extractability and different uh, category of aromas. Also, rosé coming from Seigneur are very often wine that has been uh, made as a side uh, product. So rosé from Seigneur are existing because we are trying to make reds better and we are trying to concentrate reds. Okay, so we can make good wine on both ways. It's just that we have to understand that the challenges are actually different. When we are talking about direct pressing, uh, harvest decision is going to be very important. Our way that we manage extraction, so maceration and also pressing, but also oxygen management is going to be very, very important. When we are talking about saigné, we are talking about um, 5 to 15% of the volume of a tank, but mainly we want to focus on juice preparation, preparation before fermentation and clarification. Very important to clean this juice and to adjust the juice before we go to fermentation. Then fermentation is going to be the same for both methods. Um, that's when we are creating aromas and working on the mouthfeel. So we will talk uh, a lot about pre-fermentation steps. When we will arrive to fermentation, mainly what we are going to talk about is how, um, which parameters are impacting the style and the type of aromas we can produce and how can we manage this. Post-fermentation, the aging is usually very short because uh, let's say we harvest in September, end of September we finish with fermentation and then we have um, October, November, December, we have three months and a half to prepare the wine, to age the wine and prepare it for bottling because very commonly rosé wines are bottled in January to be released in February. Okay, so post-fermentation, that's when we work on the mouthfeel and that's where we stabilize the wine and prepare it for bottling. So let's start with our process with the first step, which is harvest. Obviously, uh, that's not only for rosé, but harvest is an essential step for the wine quality. If we do rosé, we want to think rosé from the vineyards. What would it change? Um, with all the vineyard practices, but mainly, mostly, the um, fertilization uh, aspect of it, the vigor that we live in the vineyard and the yield that we are living uh, on the vines. Okay, then the grapes are um, defining the wine quality potential, so that's very important to harvest when we are at the right maturity. Harvest indicators would be bricks, so let's say 21 to 23 bricks are usually uh, the target. pH is about from 3 to 3.4 of pH. I like to look at the malic acids. On grapes, when usually the malic acid is getting is starting to decrease, it's a sign that um, basically the grapes are not going to get better for rosé. And we are not looking for phenolic maturity there. We are really looking for bricks, acidity, and sensory. So malic acid is a very good indicator of uh, picking time. Sensory is important. You mainly want... Uh, nice and elegant aromas. You don't really want green aromas or overripe aromas. Extractability, this is something you will look at to uh, manage your extraction later. So this is an indicator that will help you understanding how to manage your process. What are the key points to control during harvest? Limiting oxidation. 
How do we do this? We want to limit the mashing. We want to go as fast as possible from picking to fermentation. And also at a cold temperature and with limiting oxygen contact. It is very common to actually harvest by machine. Nowadays, um, machine harvest, like machine um, harvest, yeah, are actually um, very qualitative. So we can go fast, we can pick at night, so when it's cold, and we limit the maceration, we limit the oxidation, and we basically keep and protect our grapes. So machine harvested fruits uh, are actually considered as qualitative in rosé wine making. Okay, I put you a picture of a bean here. That is a very interesting concept that is a compartmented bean that you basically have a grill in the bean that lets the juice go through. So you have um, compartment with the juice and above you have the grapes. So the grapes and the berries are not macerating and floating in the juice, which helps you controlling the maceration. Okay, so the next step is going to be the extraction. Once you uh, pick your fruit, you want to um, build up the wine potential and you want to extract as much as you can. You want to extract the aromatic precursors, the polysaccharide and the phenolic compounds. These compounds are present in the cell walls of the skin, which means we are going to have to help these compounds to cross the full net of um, pectin polysaccharides uh, that are um, that the cell walls are composed with. So um, as you can see in this picture, basically our big molecule of aromatic precursors, polysaccharide and phenolic compounds have to cross this entire net. Um, that's not going to be easy, so we will need to help this by uh, crushing, so that's a physical help. Crushing can be good with uh, having better juice yield. Crushing can be good to have a better extraction, but crushing will also favor oxidation. Enzymes, enzymes will um, lose this net and help the molecule to cross. So enzymes will work as a uh, scissor that you can see in the picture. Uh, enzymes are actually a very great tool that is very commonly used in rosé wine making. Maceration, of course, with time and depending the temperature you are using, we are going to favor the extraction of these molecules. And uh, pressing, obviously, but pressing is a step that is almost uh, needed. So when we do speak about uh, signé wines, uh, this extraction is going to be mainly due to maceration, crushing or enzyme, but we don't have the pressing part. So if I talk a little bit more about enzymes, there is many uh, benefits of enzyme, not only extraction of aromatic compounds, phenolic compounds and polysaccharide, but also you're going to increase your free run yield. So better, higher volume of higher quality juice and you will improve your filtrability. So that's very important for later, um, the later life of the wine. I want to bring your attention to the polysaccharide because we are able to increase from 50 to 60% the content of polysaccharide, which is very uh, important numbers. Polysaccharide are gonna help on the mouthfeel, polysaccharide are gonna help on the wine stability. Very important to consider using extraction enzyme on uh, grapes and wine made from saigné because you will get more polysaccharide in this saigné juice which means you will have a more balanced juice to start with. Okay, here are some results of the Rosé Center where they are showing how um, using enzyme on grapes help with uh, the uh, free run yield uh, increase. So as you can see in this graph, the pink is the enzyme, the, the gray is the control. And every time in every lot we used, we are increasing the juice yield using enzymes. Also, uh, same type of trial with looking at the color intensity. And you can see that using enzyme, we um, most of the time are increasing the color intensity. The enzyme in the green, uh, the control is in gray. Okay, so our enzyme in Lama Tablier that we can uh, propose for rosé wine making is called Enosim Crush White. And that's an enzyme we would use on uh, grapes to do these um, five. Uh, point. So to increase the free run yield, to increase aromatic compound extraction, phenolic compound extraction, polysaccharide, 
extraction, but also it will improve settling uh, the juice and filtrability later of the wine. Okay, then uh, the other step that is very important, which I think I can actually say that it is the most important step to control when you are making rosé, and uh, I think it's a very important step when you are making white wine too, it is uh, the pressing step. So pressing is when you are actually extracting a lot of your grape potential, but that's also where you can preserve it or not. Important to uh, manage the filling condition. You really want to limit the mashing. Limiting the mashing will help you limiting the oxidation, but also limiting the extraction of potassium and limiting the turbidity and limiting the extraction of um, oxidases, so polyphenol oxidase and lacase. Then you want to limit the oxidation and oxygen contact. You can work at low temperature, use inert gas, use dry ice, use antioxidant agents. But then, even better option, use a press that can ensure you are 100% inert. No oxidation at all. Boucher developed um, a Boucher Inertis, which is a press that is covering 100% of the cycle with nitrogen. So basically, as you can see in the picture here, the press is an enclosed circuit and is linked to a nitrogen bag. And basically, the only exchange with inside outside is going to be with this nitrogen bag. So every time we deflate the membrane, the gas that will replace the volume is going to be nitrogen, not air, in uh, the standard press, which means we don't have oxidation. Every time we start to press and the juice is coming out, nitrogen is going to be put at, in the press pan. So you have a sky of nitrogen and you don't have any contact with air. I'm going to show you more um, trial result on this because it is a very interesting concept and very important step in rosé wine making. Next step is uh, try to increase uh, the qualitative juice. So the first juice is the most qualitative, the juice at low, spray, low pressure. So use enzyme, as we talked about before, to increase this yield of um, qualitative juice. And last uh, point, very important in the press, is to manage your press cycle. You want to limit rotation. Rotation will act as mashing. So any rotation, you're increasing the potassium content, you're increasing the turbidity, you are increasing the phenolic extraction, you are increasing the amount of oxidases in the juice. But also, every rotation means deflating the membrane, means if you don't work with a Boucher inertis, you are actually bringing oxygen into your juice and you are oxidizing everything. Last point, very important, separate your press fraction and treat them separately. So if we talk a little bit more about the Boucher inertis, um, there is many trials we did on uh, this equipment. It is um, very interesting when you want to protect from oxidation and preserve all the potential of your grapes into your wine. So if you look at this graph here, we are looking at um, comparing Boucher inertis with a standard classic Boucher, which would be uh, with, um, without the inert gas. We are looking at uh, acid phenol content. And as you can see, when we are pressing with a Boucher inertis, we have much more acid phenol at the end of the press, but all along the press cycle than if we are uh, pressing with a standard um, press that's because our acid phenol actually got preserved and didn't transform in quinone which are the first step of oxidation reactions so when we don't protect we are producing a lot of quinone second point that i want to show you is a glutathione glutathione is a natural antioxidant uh, present on grapes that we definitely want to preserve because it is also um, what is defining the resistance to oxidation of a wine so we are extracting glutathione through the press cycle. When we are pressing with a Boucher inertis, we maintain our glutathione fully preserved. When we press with a standard press, we are actually destroying using our glutathione as we start. So from the beginning, there is no glutathione, uh, which means this glutathione has been used as antioxidant. Not enough since we produce quinone, 
and not enough since we actually, when we look at the yellow color, we are producing a much more yellow color, which is a DO420, when we are in a normal press than a Buchar inertis. More results, if you look at the picture at the end of the press cycle, this is in Sauvignon Blanc. Standard press is brown, Buchar inertis is completely green. So when you see this color, you can imagine how much aromas we preserve, how much glutathione we preserve, and um, how much we protect it from oxidation. Last result I want to show you, they are from the Rosé Center. Uh, they have been um, uh, doing some trials with the Boucher Inertis and looking at the aroma pro aromatic profile of the final wine. Two months after conservation in bottle, you can see that the wine that we press with Boucher Inertis, which is um, the red um, on the graph here, is having much more thiolic compounds and much more preserved than if we press with a standard press. If we look at the a sensory profile, the one inert is the pink one on this graph, and you can see that it is much more uh, lemony, much more orange, much more grapefruit, and less caramel and dry roses. The control is showing more uh, caramel, dry roses, but also estery profile as we completely lost the um, varietal aromas. Caramel and dry rose are associated with um, premature aging and oxidation. So the control is having basically no um, resistance to oxidation and is aging very fast. Okay, so using uh, inert press as Boucher inertis will help you preserve your glutathione, preserve your color, preserve your aromas, which means in general, preserve your entire potential of the grapes, since we didn't produce any quinone, and also preserve your, um, the resistance of the wine later down the road. So it's not only about the juice, but everything you can preserve from the juice is gonna help you maintaining your wine fresher, more aromatic, and more stable. Then if we look at the press cycle, um, that is very important for juice quality. As I was telling you, it's important to think about separating uh, some fractions. So the bean juice is actually not considered as qualitative. The bean juice is a washing juice of the grape. That's where you have all the pesticides, the dirt, but also all the lipid and the wax present on the berries. That's usually in um, rosé made from saignée you have much more uh, of this uh, bean juice present because all this juice is washing all the berries, which can explain sometimes why rosé from Seigne tend to have a little bit more difficulty to ferment and a little bit more reductive compounds. Uh, so very important to separate this juice or you will see later to treat Seigne juice in a different way. And then we want to separate the hard presses. Um, because they are going to be richer in phenolic compounds, richer in um, potassium, which means higher pH, but they also have a different profile, as you will see. When we talk about um, press cycle, we want to look at crément cycle, but also limiting the rotation. So going slowly in increase of pressure, as you can see in the graph, the pink curve, and then trying to limit the rotation as we want to um so we want to limit rotation as i was telling you before to limit extraction of um, potassium amount of turbidity amount of lees but also uh, limiting the oxidation as it is always a hard question how do i find a compromise between the time i can spend on the press the yield i'm having and limiting rotation that's something first uh, that's why we are doing a press cut and then at the end of the press cycle, we are just having a hard press cycle, which is purely extraction, going high in pressure, and having a lot of rotations. We will treat this juice differently. So that's to make sure we are taking everything we can from the grapes. But also, when we are looking at, at um, the first uh, juice, Boucher actually developed an intelligent pressing program, which is called the organ program, that uh, you uh, can set how maximum length you want your uh, press to be, how much yield you are targeting, how many rotations you are okay to do, and then measuring the flow um, in a continuous way. Boucher program can uh, completely define time, yield, and rotation 
uh, depending the parameters you say, and they are managing it to optimize the press cycle. Okay, so our recommendation would be you do Clément style, you do increase slowly the pressure by uh, maintaining a longer uh, time by um, pressure. And then when you do your cut, which this cut can be decided by conductivity increase or pH increase or tasting or just color um, change, that's when you go on your hard press cycle, extraction cycle, and you are just taking this volume in another tank. Okay, so if we do look at some trials um, to um, where we are actually uh, separating these different categories of juice and vinifying them differently, and then we did a tasting out of it. So this trial comes from the Rosé Center. We are looking at in black the bean juice, but as you can see, it's more vegetal, it's more animal, it's actually not very clean, and it's more a dirty juice. And in terms of mouthfeel, that's definitely the less appreciated juice with uh, very short in the mouth and not very balanced. If we look at the free run press first presses, so the heart of your press cycle with the Cremant cycle, that's where we have the best um, aromatic intensity, fresher, it's a red one, uh, it's fresher, it's more uh, citrusy, and also it's the most appreciated, it is the most acidic, it has a little slight, slightly uh, bitterness, which is actually positive on rosé. Um, and then it's very balanced. Then if we look at the heart presses, and you will understand why I'm saying separate them, but keep them, just treat them differently, which is a blue line. Uh, you can see that there is much more red fruit here and also more spice. And if we look at the mouthfeel, it is the longest, the more bal most balanced and also the most um, round with bigger volume and fat um, wine. So press uh, fraction can actually give us very strong element in a blending. It's, it's a blending tool. So we do want to keep them. We just want them to treat different and we want to um, go on another style with them. Okay, so now that we uh, talked about the press part, let's talk about the preparation for fermentation. That's where, um, it's very important to deal with press and bean fraction and also saigné juice. So we do want to adjust the acidity. Thinking about a malic and tartaric ratio is very important. We uh, can think, of, we want to clarify the juice. So if you do use enzyme on grapes for extraction, you don't really need to use more enzyme because they will help settling. But if we are talking about saigné juice, we do want to use enzymes because we want to promote a fast and efficient clarification. Our enzyme in La Mota de Portfolio is called Enosim Clar. Uh, for uh, settling, it is a highly concentrated and highly purified liquid enzyme. We also want to think about fining. Fining will help removing oxidable and oxidized phenolic compounds. Fining will help you removing excessive color and fining will help you cleaning the juice from these toxins that are present in mainly on the bean juice and the senior juice. So if we do find grapes and juice, I highly recommend blends of PVPP or casein. We can offer polymix or polymix nature, which are blends of PVPP casein or blends of PVPP bentonite and um, yeast extract. Um, I'm happy to give you more information on this product. For the press fraction, if it's really about color, a carbon-based fining agent will be better. Fining during fermentation, that's when I highly uh, recommend to use bentonite. I like to stabilize my protein during fermentation, which means we will have less bentonite use and less impact on the aromas, so you don't strip the wine as much and you don't use bentonite as much. But you still stabilize for protein. I use it half fermentation. When we are talking about fining during aging, uh, if you want to treat the color, it's PVPP base that would be the most recommended. If you want to work uh, to prevent or treat oxidation, casein base. And if you are just looking at uh, fining to uh, fine tune the mouthfeel and give some brightness to the wine, eyes and glass would be the best molecule. So the Col de Poisson LA has been very successful for this goal. 
Okay, I'm very happy to talk about finding a little bit more later um, after the webinar, but please, if you have any question, uh, feel free to ask all of them. Again, very important to prepare this juice to have a clean and uh, controlled fermentation. When we are talking about fermentation, that's when we are producing all the aromas. So we want to control as much as we can uh, the yeast metabolism, which means we don't want the yeast to be stressed and we want to prepare properly the juice. Also, we want to know which parameter impacts the family of aromas we are um, wanted to produce. So um, again, think that during the press, you are defining your color with your variety, maceration, and press cycle. That's where you define your color. Okay, so now that you have your color, you want to make sure you can actually make the aroma that goes with it. So turbidity is going to be a good way um, to manage the aromas. When we are talking about low turbidity, so 100 NTU or lower, we are promoting ester production, as you can see in the graph here, uh, which are trial done in the Rosé Center in 2002. When we increase turbidity, we reduce the ester production. I have the same graph, but reverse with the varietal aromas and thiolic compounds. When we increase turbidity up to 400 turbidity, we are increasing the varietal aroma production. So it is an interesting uh, tool to play with uh, turbidity to orientate the metabolism of the yeast. Obviously, the choice of the yeast will have a strong impact on which type of aromas we are producing and the mouthfeel uh, also. Having a balanced nutrition, nutrition will help you not having stress and make sure you optimize the metabolism of the yeast. But nutrition, as we will see, will help you also orientate and choose which um, type of aromas you want to boost. Temperature, that's a very important parameter to uh, manage if you want to promote esters or thiolic compounds. As you can see in this graph here, um, so the red bar are the hot uh, fermentation, the, white, the blue is cold. And so as you can see here, uh, when we ferment hot, we are actually increasing the production of thiol, thiolic compounds. So lower than um, 55 Fahrenheit, we are promoting ester production. Between 60, 66 Fahrenheit, we are more promoting thiolic compounds production. Okay, so if we look at the yeast, the portfolio that we have in La Motabie, we have three yeasts to offer from uh, for white and rosé, uh, that are really three um, distinct styles. So the FTH, Excellence FTH, is going to be uh, to produce a very citrusy, very thiolic, and very fresh um, rosé. So they usually go on a very light color. So the example I took you before, the O12, N12, um, color case are perfect for this yeast. It's going to give you a very tight and acidic uh, mouthfeel profile. TXL, TXL, is, Excellence TXL is actually my favorite yeast for rosé when you have, if you have one tank of rosé and you can't play with blends. Um, TXL is going to give you a little bit of ester, a little bit of thiol, so very complex aromatic profile, but also a very round and balanced mouthfeel. So this is more a wine that will have a color like lychee or peach skin type of color. We are more looking at um, a soft and round mouthfeel with a complex aromas. Our last yeast, STR, uh, Excellence STR, is here to produce a lot of ester. So that's the yeast we use on press fraction or on juice from Seigneur. And that's also a yeast that we will use on more um, colored uh, juice, so a little bit darker juice. It's going to produce a lot of berries and also um, red fruits, so you do, and floral um, component too. So you do want uh, to use it on a wine that will be darker in color. Okay, then if we talk about nutrition, as I was telling you, very important to make sure the yeast is comfortable. Uh, I did previously a webinar on yeast nutrition, so I'm not going to develop too much on uh, this point. I just want to talk about our yeast protector and yeast rehydrator, uh, Anosteam. It is vitamin, minerals, and sterols that will help the yeast feeling healthy, resistant, and will optimize the metabolism of the yeast. So as you can see, we are able to reduce the production of, of sulfur compounds, reduce the production of VA, and increase the production of 
thiolic compounds or varietal aromas, mainly because we are ensuring a complete and regular um, alcoholic fermentation. We are increasing yeast resistance, yeast implantation, and we are optimizing yeast metabolism. So we have more aromatic wine. So whatever the style and whatever uh, the technique of production of wine, an steam would be always recommended. Then to boost aromatics, we have um, a nutrient called optithiol. Optithiol is a uh, great to uh, increase your antioxidant protection and also to optimize your thiolic compound. So we use it more on thiolic varieties or on uh, wine where you want some citrusy and uh, grapefruit type aromas. It is inactivated yeast rich in cysteine and glutathione. So the glutathione act as an antioxidant and the cysteine act as precursors of thiolic compounds. We use it before inoculation at 15 to 30 grams per hectoliters. And as you can see in um, the graph here, this allowed us to increase a lot, almost double, um, the amount of thiolic compounds in the final wine. Very interesting concept. It actually stays uh, after nine months after fermentation. So that's um, not just during fermentation, but we do increase this uh, antioxid antioxidant protection and resistance to the wine. Other uh, nutrients that we can use to go on the other category of style is called optiester. So that's going to be more for saignée or for press fraction or for wine that don't have any um, juice that don't have any precursors, so some varieties don't have precursors, so in this case, no point to boost thiolic compounds if we don't have them. Let's go on esters compounds. Uh, Opti-ester is a selection of amino acids and ergosterol that has been selected to promote and boost the production of ethyl esters. Ethyl esters are more the floral, pear, green apple type of esters that are more subtle than just a banana bomb. We, uh, to optimize um, the application of optiester, we use it during the first third of the fermentation with a, combined with a low turbidity, low temperature in anaerobic condition. And in this case, we can increase up to 44% the amount of ester produced in the wine. So that's actually a very great tool to boost the aromatic production. Okay, so this is during fermentation. If you feed your yeast properly, if you manage your turbidity, temperature, and also you can play with um, nutrients to boost the aromatic compounds, uh, you should have a pretty um, good fermentation, pretty complete and regular. So after fermentation, we are starting uh, the aging, which uh, again, it lasts about three to four months, and that's where we can work on the most feel stability of the wine and protection. We definitely don't want to uh, screw up everything we worked so hard on um, previously in the process. So the first thing to do is to protect from oxidation, limit headspace, use inert gas, so you spout with nitrogen for any transfer, you blanket with CO2 or argon. Use qualitative cellar equipments and make sure you are having uh, good uh, cellar, cellar practices. Okay, if you look at the table here, this is a table that is actually an average low. Uh, if you don't work good, any cellar action can dissolve a full um, saturation, which means six to seven uh, milligram per liter of oxygen, which would be a disaster. So please be very careful when you pump, when you transfer your wine, but also use good equipment that don't dissolve too much oxygen. Working on the mouthfeel and also having an antioxidant protection is uh, do some finely steering. Since we do use, uh, I recommend to use bentonite during fermentation, you definitely want to remove your heavy gross leaves from the tank and keep your fine leaves that you keep in suspension to work on this, the autolysis and the mouthfeel, the release of manoprotein, but also to work as an antioxidant protection. If your leads are not good, taste your leads before doing this. If your leads are not good or you don't have the effect you are expecting because it's just too slow, use uh, alternative, which are Aroma Protect is our uh, manoprotein that is a yeast derivate rich in glutathione. So we do give this mouthfeel sensation and roundness, plus we give glutathione that will increase your antioxidant potential. We use it end of fermentation 
or beginning of aging. Then, as you can see in the table here, the step that dissolves the most oxygen is a cold stabilization. It is a very dangerous uh, step in rosé and white wine making. Very often, we put it cold, we dissolve a lot of oxygen, but we don't consume it, so we just accumulate dissolved oxygen because it's cold. Then you rack your filter, you warm up your tank to go to bottle. When you warm up your tank, you start to consume this dissolved oxygen. Because it is a lot, you basically give a huge shot of dissolved oxygen to your wine suddenly, and you start every single oxidation uh, reaction will start at the same time. And two weeks after, your wine turns brown, your wine smells like dry flour and caramel, and you have premature aging. Premature aging is very often due to a big oxygen pickup at one point, which most commonly it is due to cold stabilization. This says you still want to stabilize your wine, so it's important to think about alternative. Now there is a manoprotein, such as our Stab K, Arabic gum, such as our gum LA or CMC, such as our Vino Protect, that can be used on rosé or whites um, to stabilize for tartrate. I highly and always recommend to test um, the wine before and to do a bench trial where you put the product, you try different concentration and you see which one works at which concentration before you add it into the tank. And uh, if you are interested in this, I'm very happy to give you a protocol on how to test or to um, give you some recommendation. So please contact me on this. I will be happy to help. Okay, so we arrive at our last step, which is a uh, bottling and closure choice. Bottling is the uh, most uh, dangerous uh, part because once you bottle your wine, you uh, can't do anything. But uh, most likely what can happen is or a microbial contamination or oxygen pickup and oxidation. So prepare your wine before, make sure you have actually a good dissolved CO2. Uh, make sure you're happy with the blending and you're stable. Um, dissolved CO2 is a tool that is uh, very commonly used in Provence and in actually many white wine as well to boost the acidity, to boost the freshness and to give like a little um, fizz or a little uh, peps, uh, some energy and liveliness into the wine. So you make the wine more alive with uh, CO2. Uh, very often, we are targeting 12 to 1400 milligrams per liter of dissolved CO2 at bottling. Filtration, sterile filtration is important since we don't do malolactic fermentation. You want to make sure you are covered. Measure DO before, during, after bottling, very important, and sparge with nitrogen as much as you can, everything you can to avoid any oxygen pickup during bottling. Your closer choice, that's um, just want to let you know that there is many different closure choice on the market. You have to choose it depending on your winemaking style, life, and length that you are going to age the wine in bottle when you're going to release it. Speak with your supplier. Uh, there is many alternatives uh, now that exist to um, be able to manage exactly how much oxygen goes through. So that's a very interesting tool. Okay, so thank you very much for this, uh, for your attention. Just as um, a summary of this presentation, I think uh, the message was pretty uh, strong on uh, taking care of all the pre-fermentation steps. That's where you have all the big work to do. And that's where you will extract your potential. That's where you will define your color. And that's also where you will make sure you are actually uh, building up resistance uh, to oxidation into your wine. The most, um, the two main things that could happen in wine that are actually not good would be oxidation and microbial uh, contamination. Usually, uh, you can manage very well the microbial um, aspect of it because we play a lot with inoculation and um, we want to make sure we control the metabolism of the yeast. About oxidation, please be careful with uh, a biodiometer and measure and be careful with it. Use cold as a tool, use SO2 as a tool, use antioxidants and protect your juice so you keep your potential in the wine. Okay, so think uh, the last point I want to make sure you think about is think about coherence. I think that's the key. Define your color and once you have your color, you can actually control um, your full program 
or winemaking process to produce aromas you want and to work on the mouthfeel and you will have a coherent rosé wine that will be successful. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, email me at eglantine.chauffour at bouchervaslin.com. Uh, but also you can stay online now and I will open the question and answer portion. Thank you very much.